plug it. Welcome to week six of basic equitation. So we did do a little flip-flop in the schedule. Um, reason being for that, this week we are going to go over farrier and equine dentistry information. During your lab time this week, we will have a guest lecture from an industry professional. Danny McCorder will be there during your normal class meeting time on Wednesday. Um, he does a significant amount of corrective farrier work. Um, one day a week, he's actually at Dr. O'Brien's, um, so the local vet here is shooing out of his facility, um, aside from um, his other clients and so forth. So he's going to be here on Wednesday shooing two different horses. Make sure that as you watch this lecture that you are paying attention to the anatomy of the hoof, the purpose of why we should utilize a knowledgeable farrier, and then the different tools that they use and what the purposes are. So make sure that you use this as an introduction to the information um, to set you up for success during that lab time. During your lab time, um, while Danny is going through and, and trimming and shoeing and resetting these horses, he's going to walk you through the steps, the different things that he evaluates, um, and how he goes throughout that process. Um, so make sure that you pay attention and that you're set up for success on that. In addition to, make sure that you have detailed out a couple of questions um, that you may be interested in asking him. It's important that when we have these guest lectures that we take full advantage of them coming in and giving their time to us. So we want to make sure that we utilize his knowledge and his information um, during his time during your class period. We're going to start lecture this week with a basic overview relating to hoof care and then jump into the importance of farriers. In looking at review of parts of the hoof, we went over the basics of this during week two when we covered anatomy. Um, in looking at the hoof wall, the hoof wall constantly grows downward from the coronary band at the rate of about half an inch a month. It takes about nine months to a year to grow a new hoof wall. A normal hoof wall is smooth. However, if a horse has suffered a dietary change or is in poor health, rings can develop around the hoof. The hoof wall is divided into three different sections, the toe, the quarter, and the heel. So those three different sections are going to make up the hoof wall, the toe, the quarter, and the heel. The next part of the hoof in review is the frog. This is the wedge-shaped pad of the elastic horn that is in contact with the ground. Its function is to provide traction to aid in the reduction of concussion and to help circulate blood through the front and back. Through the front, or excuse me, circulate blood through the hoof um, and then back up the leg. As for the sole, the sole is the larger surface of the foot that protects the sensitive structure above it. The sole should be slightly concave and is non-weight bearing. The thickness of the sole will vary from horse to horse as a horse with thinner soles are greatly more prone to bruising. When considering maintenance of the hoof, everyone has heard the saying, no hooves, no horse. A horse that has damages or weak hooves is at higher risk for being lame and this leads to no horse to ride or a horse that is able that is unable to perform their function. So whether that be breeding, riding, um, or showing. A sound and healthy feet make the horse and maintaining the horse's hoof health is very important. As a horse owner or someone that is managing horses, it's very important that we're picking out their feet regularly. As a horse is that is stalled needs to have its hooves picked out at least twice a day and a pasture kept horse needs to have their hooves cleaned at least once a day. When picking out the horse's hooves it is important that you work from the heel downward making sure to clean out the clefts of the frog. Horses that are stalled tend to be exposed to wetter conditions. If a horse's hooves are exposed to a wet environment for a prolonged period of time they are at risk for developing thrush. To prevent this, it is also important to make sure that the stalls are cleaned regularly as well as have ample turnout time 
to help dry out the feet. However, on the flip side of that is horses that are in areas where conditions are dry as their feet may become hard and brittle. And during this time, it becomes important that a horse owner or whoever is in charge of management use a good hoof supplement or use a good top dressing to keep the hooves moist. As far as here at the farm, um, some of our horses are on a hoof supplement and we use a hoof supplement that is through Excel Equine. Next we have our farrier visits in, in relation to maintenance of the hoof. And while nutrition and climate play a major role in hoof health, it is also important that horses receive regular visits from a farrier every six to eight weeks. As a horse owner, it is your responsibility to make sure that your horses um, have had their feet messed with prior to the farrier visit. We've talked multiple times about how horses are individuals and there's variation from horse to horse. Um, some horses are able to hold a shoe for longer. Um, some horses will be able to maintain soundness and perform at the desired level um, at eight weeks, whereas others will need a reset at six weeks. So six to eight weeks um, is going to be the timeline for having a horse set up for farrier services, whether you choose to trim or your horses are being shod. This brings us into information on um, farriers specifically and is no longer a review component. Um, initially, I want to look at the relationship between vets and farriers as that is very important. The history of the veterinarian and farrier profession is rather unique because they had their origins as one. These two ancient and honorable professions spring jointly from mankind's effort to provide care and support to his most long-lived and faithful companion, the horse. In past ages, um, or in ages past, as science and medicine embraced technology and traveled different paths, they split. So these two professions split with the development of science and different um, technologies. They each developed its own practice, science and ethics, and now in many ways they are coming back together again. The earliest veterinarians were farriers. They were men's with iron and fire at their fingertips. As knowledge of medicine and science grew, a parallel course developed, with those who worked with iron developing the technical strength to meet the cha changing needs, whereas veterinarians followed a course of medicine and physiology where they began to treat and prevent the illnesses that plagued civilization. The real split came as horses were abandoned for automobiles and farriery became a technology-driven means of expanding the Iron Age. Veterinarians became doctors concerned with the herds of animals or individual pets, whereas farriers became blacksmiths, working with horses acquired for competition and pleasure instead of for work. Today, after decades of revolutionary research into the anatomy, physiology, and pathology of the equine hoof, our two professions are closer than ever before to joining the ranks and reaching an understanding of many of the fundamental pathological conditions of the equine foot, as both are significantly driven by education and technology in today's time. The cooperation and communication between equine veterinarians and farriers is both essential for the successful application of therapeutic farriery. It is the responsibility of the farrier not only to assess and shoe horses accordingly, but also to work alongside the veterinarian in providing therapeutic farriery to manage certain hoof abnormalities. With this in mind, it is important for owners to find a farrier in which they can trust in order to maintain overall equine welfare. With that being said, if you come to lab on Wednesdays when Danny is here, um, I'm sure he will discuss some of his therapeutic um, shoeing that he has done. Um, he works very, very closely with Dr. O'Brien. Um, he's always up there at least a minimum of one day a week. I believe that's actually Wednesdays. Um, I know specifically I've had a couple of experiences there where I had a mare 
that I was having issues with lameness that was occurring um, over a period of time. I was able to go to O'Brien. He was able to do a lameness evaluation, complete a couple of x-rays, determine that we were dealing with um, navicular disease or navicular syndrome. At that point, um, I was then able to meet with Danny. Danny was able to discuss the issues and the findings that Dr. O'Brien found, and then we were able to set up my mare with a therapeutic um, shoeing technique through Danny. So he has a very good working um, relationship with Dr. O'Brien. So that relationship between your vet and your farrier is very, very important. Um, following down from that, looking at problems with the hoof, um, investigations that highlight the problems of the hoof as the most frequent owner-reported cause of lameness, um, excluding that occurring from laminitis or founder. Um, so most frequently reported cases of lameness relate to different problems within the hoof. The condition of the hoof has long been recognized as relating directly to both athletic performance and equine welfare, and therefore it is necessary to establish current attitudes towards routine hoof care and their potential implications. When considering conventional farriery um, and looking at achieving balance, one should take into account factors such as workload, management, confirmation, and dynamic loading when, when assessing hooves for farriery. Balance is conventionally achieved by working towards both medial-lateral balance. The medial-lateral balance um, is whereby loading should be equal across the heel on impact. So here I have in our PowerPoint um, heel to toe. So ideally, when a horse is comfortable and when they aren't experiencing any lameness issues, um, they're able to travel naturally, a horse is going to land heel and then toe. In a horse that is experiencing pain or has different lameness issues within um, the hoof of the lower limb, these horses may appear to be walking on eggshells and they are going to land toe to heel. So toe to heel is not natural nor is it um, an ideal footfall pattern. So when considering that medial lateral balance when loading should be equal across the heel on impact, when that initial impact is occurring that should be on the heel, we want to make sure that it's evenly distributed um, prior to landing on the toe. And then we have dorsal palmer balance. And this is the alignment of the hoof pastern axis. Um, I'm not going to question you on what is medial lateral balance or what is dorsal palmar balance. But it, what it is important that you understand is that balance is conventionally achieved um, by working towards the equal loading across the heel on impact and also the alignment of the hoof and pastern axis. So that, that's the information you need to know. You don't have to be able to define um, which is medial lateral and which is dorsal palmar balance. Um, a horse's conformation and loading pattern should be assessed individually and their hoof balanced accordingly. It may not be possible to balance some horses in accordance to the ideal parameters due to their conformation or otherwise may take some time to achieve optimum balance. Following up from that, there are a number of technological advancements which have occurred that have allowed the advancement of farriery. Historically, all shoes were made of iron and they were all um, attached to our horse's hoof using nails. Different advancements, only to mention a, sh a few, is the use of the aluminum shoe. I know personally I've had a couple of experiences using aluminum shoes with horses that do have lameness issues and navicular syndrome as it increases the breakover. Um, it also provides a number of other benefits. So in using a lighter aluminum shoe, um, these can come in a number of styles, including a wedge or a rocker, only to mention a few. Um, in addition, we've also seen the use of glue-on shoes, so shoes can now be glued to the horse's hoof um, rather than being placed with nails, and that's only to mention a few. The rapid changes in technology have allowed us to suddenly do things in the horse's feet, both preventively and therapeutically, 
that were undreamed of a decade ago. We now have plastics that allow us to bond an aluminum shoe to the hoof without nails, um, which is now commonplace and becoming better all the time. There is also alloys that absorb concussion as they do not remodel and allow the foot to maintain its physiology are suddenly being used in place of iron. Um, the fact that in this method the laminae no longer have to be punctured by nails is a giant step in the right direction um, in the development and improvement of therapeutic shoeing techniques. The big takeaway message from this is that for the most part, a farrier's skills and the knowledge is one's best insurance when it comes to keeping a horse's hooves and lower limbs healthy and properly shod. As after all, your horse's soundness is largely dependent on the health, stability, and balance of the lower limbs and hooves. We are now going to move into tools of the trade um, relating to farriery. The first one that we have photographed here is hoof testers. This is a device that is used in the examination of the horse's hooves to pinpoint the sources of pain by applying pressure in certain areas. This tool is used by the farrier looking for an abscess or by a veterinarian as part of a standard lameness exam. However, care must be taken by the user to reduce the chances of a false positive reading from a sensitive horse. So in using this tool, it will be opened up um, and then will be used to apply pressure to varying points of the horse's hoof in order to determine what areas may be sensitive and may be causing the, the lameness issues. Following that, we have a farrier's rasp. This is a multi-purpose tool that all farriers use. It is like a nail file for horses and enables the farrier to keep the horse's hooves even and level if unshawled or lightly rasp any hoof that overhangs a shoe. It is used to finish a trim by rasping off any excess hoof and rounding up the edges. It can also be used to rasp down the nails and the hoof wall where it is needed. Here we have a farrier's knife. The farrier uses this specialized knife to cut out excess sole and frog in the feet of the horse. There's both left-handed and right-handed versions of this knife that are available, allowing the farrier to use the appropriate hand depending on the side of the horse of which he is working. As these knives are very sharp and can be dangerous, to both the farrier and the horse if not used properly. Next we have hoof nippers. These are used to cut the hoof wall down to the correct length and to cut off any excess or damaged sole or hoof area to reduce the need for extra rasping. Skilled farriers use hoof nippers to remove not only the overgrown hoof but also to bevel the edge of the hoof to reduce the amount of rasping that is required. Hoof nippers are also used to trim the frog of the hoof. Because hoof nippers look similar to hoof pullers, the traditional finish of the hoof nippers has straight handle ends while the handle ends of the puller have rounded balls. So that being said, in this photograph here in this slide we've discussed hoof nippers. So hoof nippers, the ends, um, the ends of the handles are going to have a straight finish. In contrast to the nippers, our pullers at the end of the handle are going to have rounded balls. So keep that in mind and being a really good way to identify the nippers versus the pullers. Um, this tool looks like a hoof nipper, although it is actually larger. It is used to pull the horse's shoe or shoes when necessary. And before using this tool, the farrier will unclench the nails um, using a clinching block prior to pulling. This reduces the damage that would otherwise occur in pulling a shoe with the clinches still holding fast. Um, patience is key in pulling a shoe as working both sides of the shoe branches to gradually loosen the nails. Used incorrectly, pullers can place undue pressure on the horse's sensitive sole and cause pain or bruising. So I think this is a good opportunity in discussing, this, in discussing this tool that patience is key is that we also keep in mind that 
if you are here for Wednesday Lab and you watch Danny work, that he's very um, he's very skilled and quick in in his mannerisms and completing his task when shoeing or trimming a horse. Um, however, any of you that have horses of your own that may have tried to pull a shoe um, or trim a shoe yourself, you can attest to how difficult that can be and how this is certainly a skill that is developed over a period of time. Here we have an anvil. Um, all farriers need an anvil to mold horseshoes into the proper shape and styles needed. Since each horse's hoof is different, the farrier needs to custom fit each shoe by shaping it on the anvil. Another use of the anvil is to make sure that the shoes are absolutely flat, as it is very difficult to flatten a shoe without the skill of the farrier and the use of the anvil. If the shoe is not absolutely flat, then it will certainly pull off and may cause pain to the horse. We've said it time and time again, each horse is different. Each horse um, has different requirements and different versions of normal, same as humans. So when looking at horseshoes, instead of those being um, sized in five, six, seven, um, like human sizes, they will be sized as a a uh, double lot, a triple lot, an aught, um, only to mention a couple. So let's say that we have a horse that wears a double lot shoe. So when our farrier goes and purchases a box of shoes and it's labeled as double lot, he can't simply take that shoe out of the box and put it on my horse. Um, there's still going to be a level of um, customization that needs to occur. And so by using an amble, they can custom fit that shoe to ensure that it will fit my horse um, correctly and provide the benefit so that he or she is able to perform at their highest level. Um, following that, we have a farrier's nailing hammer. Um, this is a small hammer that is used to punch nails through the horse's hoof to hold the shoe into place. The one side is used to drive the nails and the other side, which has two protruding claws, allows the farrier to wring off the nail when it comes out the side of the horse's hoof. This hammer is surprisingly small and it is important that the farrier obtain a feel for the nail as it is driven to make sure the nail emerges at the correct level. In nailing on a horseshoe, it is very important that each nail is precisely placed. If a nail is set too high or set incorrectly, it can cause what we consider a hot nail, and this is a nail that may cause pain or result in an unsoundness or lameness in the horse. So it's very important that these nails are placed precisely and accurately. Next we have a nail clincher. These clinchers are used to fold over the nail to make sure the horseshoe stays on the hoof. There are two different kinds of clinchers that are used, and one has a short ball-like head and the other an alligator-like head. Most farriers develop a personal preference for the one that works best for them. As clinching the nails is one of the final steps of shoeing a horse, followed mostly by cosmetic rasping. The tool displayed here is a nailing block or a clinching block. This is usually a small piece of metal with an angulated edge, as shown on the left-hand side. It is put underneath the rung-off nail when setting the nails before clinching. The nailing block is held against the nail clinch while the farriers strike the nail head to seat it into the shoe. This tool is also used to unclinch a nail prior to pulling the shoe. So on the left-hand side, we can see this tool in action. Excuse me, on the right hand side we can see this tool in action. And our final tool for tools of the trade for farrier is a hoof gauge. Some farriers will use a specialized gauge to measure the hoof angles and check the balance of the hoof. This is a relatively new item in the farrier's toolkit and some farriers prefer to use their eyes and their expertise when determining hoof angles and balance. The hoof gauge gives a more precise and objective measurement and can be used to assure that the left and right sides of the horse have similar hoof angles. So this will conclude our portion of the lecture 
on farriery and will be a good basis of understanding so that you're able to follow along with Danny um, as he goes through his demonstration on Wednesday. We are now ready to discuss equine dentistry. So again, we'll start with a little bit of a review of information before digging further deeper. Um, it is important to remember that the horse's teeth continually grow throughout their lifetime and also that the horse's upper jaw is wider than the lower jaw. As a result of this anatomy with the horse's upper jaw being wider than the horse's lower jaw, the outside edges of the top teeth and the inside edges of the lower teeth do not get worn down and therefore they develop sharp points. The sharp enamel points can make it difficult for horses to properly chew their food and this can lead to large particles in the digestive tract and cause the horse to be at risk for an impaction colic. And additionally, the sharp enamel points can cause sores in the horse's mouth and allow bacteria and toxins to enter the horse's bloodstream. The sores also can cause behavioral problems in horses, especially when a bit is placed in the horse's mouth. And considering that, um, I also want you to be able to identify a couple or identify different type of teeth um, as they, as to how they are placed in the horse's mouth. As we get further into this lecture, and we're talking about aging the horse. And then also the different um, methods of floating. And as Kustra is going through this on Thursday, it's going to be important that you're able to identify um, where different types of teeth are located in the horse's mouth. Um, this diagram of the horse's school, if we start on the um, lower side, we have our horse's incisors. Um, then we have the canines. Um, following that on the upper jaw, is a circle that would be the location of the wolf teeth. Um, this horse here is likely an older horse and most of the time wolf teeth are going to erupt at one year of age and then be pulled um, for a number of reasons. So most horses are not going to have um, wolf teeth um, as they age so there's a, a solid reason for why this location is circled but there are no visible teeth. Um, then we can see we have our horse's premolars, and then behind the premolars is our horse's molars. So make sure you can identify the incisors, the canines, the wolf teeth, the premolars, and the molars. It is important to understand proper dental examinations and treatments are among some of the most important, but also the most neglected aspects of equine health care. It is true that a horse can be aged um, by looking at their teeth. Um, estimating the age of the horse by looking at its teeth is a very common practice. The age of the horse can be marked on four major ways. This includes the appearance of the permanent teeth, the disappearance of the cups, the angle of the incisors, and also the shape of the surface of the permanent teeth. I do not expect that you're going to memorize this chart. Um, however, it is a, a good overview of understanding the deciduous teeth or per se the baby teeth, um, what those different types of teeth are, at what point they will erupt, and then also the permanent teeth and at what point those teeth will erupt in the horse. So absolutely not a chart that you need to memorize but I did believe it gives you a good overview. Um, once more, this is a diagram that is a good visual for seeing how a horse's mouth is going to change over time. Um, so we have an example of how a yearling or a one-year-old horse's mouth is going to look versus a horse that is three, five, 10, 15, and 20. So I'm not going to go into a significant amount of detail using um, the initial chart and then also this visual, 
However, in taking notes on aging the horse, it will be beneficial to reference these charts for information so that you have a full understanding. For this slide, I have included the different ages of the horse that I will mention and how you can determine a horse is at that age. The ones in red, make sure you know those. Um, the others are um, good to, a, to an overall understanding, but I won't test you on those. The ones that are highlighted in red, make sure you know them. Um, when the horse reaches about two and a half years of age, it will lose its temporary central incisors, which are replaced with permanent teeth. During this time period, the horse gets two permanent molars on both sides of their upper and lower jaw. Around the age of three and a half, the horse will replace the temporary lateral incisors with the permanent ones, and they will now have four permanent molars on both sides of each jaw. So that's at three and a half, that the horse will now have four permanent molars on each side of the jaw. At about four years of age, the last permanent molars erupt, giving the horse a total of six permanent molars on each jaw, which is at the age of four. Between four and a half to five years, the horse should have all of its permanent teeth. At this age, one is considered to be full-mouthed. At five to six years, the corner incisors are at full length and are now beginning to wear against each other. When the horse is six, the infundilament has gone from the central incisor tables and is becoming smaller on the lateral incisor tables and just starting to appear on the corner incisors. The dental star has also begun to appear on the central and lateral incisors. At the age of seven, there is a hook that begins to appear on the top corner um, incisors. However, horses also get a hook at the age of 11. So it's important to look at the slope and angle of the horse's teeth to determine the difference between one that is seven and 11 um, based upon this hook that appears on the top corner incisors. A horse at the age of seven should have teeth that are fairly upright, and also at seven years, the tables will be oval in shape. At eight years of age, the hook will have disappeared and the tables will begin to take on a triangular shape. From this point on, aging the horse becomes very difficult to do by looking at their teeth alone. So from um, a foal um, to a horse that is eight years old, they are going to be easily identifiable to break into um, specific years. However, moving upward into nine and beyond, um, a range can be predicted, but pinpointing an exact age is going to be difficult. By the age of nine, the infundilament will have disappeared from the teeth. The Galvain's groove will begin to appear on the upper corner incisors and work its way down when the horse is around ten. So 10 is going to be the age at which the Galvain's groove is going to appear. Around the age of 11, the hook will appear again on the upper incisors. So we said that is a commonality between a horse that is 7 and a horse that is 11 is going to be the hook that will begin to appear on the upper incisors. At the age of 15, the Galvain's groove will be about halfway down the tooth and the tables will begin to become more rounded. Once the horse turns 20, the Galvain's groove will have reached the bottom of the tooth and the horse's teeth will now take on a sloped appearance. So the age of 20, the Galvain's groove will have reached the bottom of the tooth. Moving on from aging, we're now ready to talk about proper equine um, dentistry and why proper maintenance is going to be very important in allowing peak performance of the horse. Proper dental maintenance is essential to allow peak performance and harmony between the horse and rider. Through dental care, um, relying on horsemanship skills and proper training, we can prevent premature tooth loss and promote more complete utilization of feed. 
This can also reduce the instances of impaction and gas colic and alleviate um, joint pain. It can allow a less stressful eruption of the permanent teeth by the timely removal of the shedding deciduous teeth. This can also be referred to as CAPS. Um, and it can prevent pain due to the use of a bit, making it easier for the horse to be trained and to provide other benefits. Floating is the most common dental procedure veterinarians perform on horses, veterinarians, or other trained personnel. Floating is the process of rasping or filing down a horse's teeth to remove the sharp enamel points and create an even chewing plane. Floating also keeps incisors and cheek teeth at a desirable length as we talked about how the horse's teeth continually grow over their lifetime. Um, the bit may also be irritated by wolf teeth in a horse's mouth. We talked about wolf teeth um, in the initial slide when looking at anatomy and where they were located when we first started talking about equine dentistry. Wolf teeth are small teeth that generally erupt in the front of the in front of the first cheek teeth in the upper jaw. Most often these teeth erupt by one year of age. Not all wolf teeth cause problems, however enough of them do. These teeth also do not serve a purpose in chewing and therefore it is recommended that wolf teeth be removed when they are found in a horse's mouth. Um, many trainers will require that a horse's teeth have been evaluated and the wolf teeth removed prior to starting a young colt. So something to keep in mind if, if you are purchasing or working with young horses is if they do have wolf teeth or if they've been removed. Dropping back into floating as it is one of the most common um, dental procedures to be performed. The first dental floating um, could be done as early as six months of age and then the teeth should be floated every six months until the age of five years old. So from horses that are one to five, floating is recommended every six months. By the time the horse is five years old, it should have shed all of its baby teeth and have a full set of permanent teeth. Horses from five to about 15 years of age usually need to be floated one time a year. Older horses have to be checked um, every six months, especially if they are missing teeth, have poor alignment, or other conformational um, issues or flaws. That being said, um, just because it's recommended for an annual floating or dental evaluation um, for horses that are 5 to 12 years old, there are instances that require um, incre increased frequency. Um, personally, I have a mare that does require increased frequency. I've had her since she was um, 7 years old, I believe, and I've had her for the last 10 or 11 years. And this mare um, clearly had a tough start at, at life and she does require um, more frequent floating. Um, the first time that I had her teeth floated when I, owned, uh, when I owned her, they opened up her mouth and immediately you can see that the conformation of her tongue um, is very unique. She has a scar that runs all the way across her tongue this is likely the result um, of harsh training techniques and a harsh bit that caused a cut across her tongue. Um, luckily, it did heal. Um, a bit still sets normally in her mouth, and she prefer performs very well. Um, however, this injury had requires that she have more frequent um, dental floatings. We are now ready to discuss the typical equine evaluation. Um, most professionals will divide the equine dental evaluation into four different parts. This includes a pre-evaluation interview, an evaluation outside of the horse's mouth, an evaluation inside the horse's mouth, and then following this, a discussion of one's findings. Um, to begin with, a pre-evaluation interview um, this can take place between yourself and then the dental professional before they look at your horse. Um, some basic questions that may be asked include um, why would you made 
why would why did you make this appointment um, sometimes there's changes in a horse's eating behavior or weight loss um, a trainer may have noticed a difference in the horse's reaction to the bit or a performance change or a veterinarian may have found dental conditions beyond the scope that he felt comfortable with treating um, or an owner may just be requesting a second opinion or want routine dental maintenance to be completed. So it's important that the question is asked, you know, why was this appointment made so that you can provide additional detail on the situation with your horse. A couple of other questions that a dental professional may ask you is what is the horse's age? Um, this can help one to determine the presence uh, or to predict the presence of certain teeth and dental conditions that they should be looking for depending on the age of the horse. Um, they may ask where does the horse live and what is his diet. In general there is more desirable tooth wear in horses that live out on pasture and eat native grasses whereas horses that live exclusively in a barn and eat cut or baled hay and grain often have improper tooth wear. Um, confinement may also contribute to chewing vices which result in uneven tooth wear. It is important to consider if the horse is at an appropriate weight. Um, what is the horse's occupation? For example, does this horse um, carry a bit often? Has this horse displayed different performance changes that may be of concern? Um, it is normal when considering what the horse's occupation is that if they are a riding horse that the dental professional may ask to see the horse's bit and cheeks to see how it fits your horse um, as dental problems will make it uncomfortable for the horse to have a bit in his mouth and the horse with dental problems may chew the bit um, unnecessarily tilt his head or resist turning stopping or yielding um, they may ask if the horse has been chewing or eating oddly or are they dropping food out of their mouth when consuming their meals and then what is the horse's general disposition to determine if there have been any changes in this area. Following this evaluation um, then oftentimes an evaluation outside of the horse's mouth is going to be completed. So this involves looking at the overall horse and the symmetry of the skeletal structure and the muscles of the head. It's important to check and see if the horse's weight is appropriate and then observe whether he carries his head, neck, and body straight. The uh, professionals may consider when looking at a horse's face, um, it may be obvious that one eye or ear is located higher than the other, a condition that can affect dental function. Um, oftentimes, a dental professional will palpate the bony and soft structures of the head and neck with both hands as the muscle on one side of the head may be larger and rounder from overuse while the same muscle on the other side of the head may be flat due to lack of use. Um, this can help to predict one-sided chewing and evidence of old injuries may also be found by palpating um, the bony and soft structures of the head and the neck. Um, it is also important to consider the TMJ joint, which is the attachment of the lower jaw to the skull. The TMJ is often put under stress as a result of poorly functioning teeth, and tenderness, heat, or swelling in this area may be felt around the stressed TMJ during the evaluation. After an evaluation outside the mouth has occurred, we are then ready to... Um, have an evaluation inside the mouth performed. The third part of the evaluation includes examining the teeth and all other soft tissue structures inside the horse's mouth. The dental professional will look for many things including the appropriate number of teeth, the presence of deciduous teeth, wolf teeth, canine teeth, broken teeth, irregular tooth shapes, and irregular tooth wear patterns. They may also look for ulceration inside the mouth and the freedom of the jaw to make normal chewing motions. A uniqueness or a unique tool that is used when performing a dental evaluation or floating or pulling of the wolf teeth is a speculum. So that is shown in the bottom right hand photograph and our cute little mini um, that has a speculum on. 
The full mouth speculum is an instrument that rests against the horse's upper and lower front teeth to assist him or her in holding open their mouth. This unusual looking instrument increases the safety for both the horse and the dental professional. Most horses find comfort in having a place to rest their teeth. To prevent strain on the TMJ, the mouth should not be opened any wider than is necessary and should not be held open any longer than necessary. The average horse will remain comfortable with the speculum adjusted so the upper and lower incisors are about two and a half inches apart. It is critical that the dental professional pay attention to the horse's behavior while the speculum holds the mouth open. A horse that begins to nod or shake his head is often reporting the need for a rest. Frequent rest, or so the horse is allowed to close its mouth, will help the horse tolerate the evaluation and prevent strain. This is especially important for horses with pre-existing TMJ pain. The final step of a equine dental evaluation is the dental professional's explanation of findings. The explanation will include a description of the general condition of the horse's mouth relative to his age and all specific abnormalities which were found in an explanation of the treatment options. So at this point, I'm going to complete our lecture for this week because you now have a basic understanding of the anatomy, um, how teeth can be used to age the horse, and also the initial steps of a equine dental evaluation and minimal information on floating of the horse's teeth. Um, Kustra will perform dental evaluations and likely be floating a couple of the horse's teeth here at Western's Farm during lab on Thursday. This will complete your lecture for week six for basic equitation, so you're now ready to complete your assignment. Keep in mind, during that lab time this week, we will have a guest lecture, so Danny will be here. Um, if there is extra time at the end of that class meeting, so it's a two-hour block, if there is extra time at the end, um, then we will backtrack on week five um, since we were canceled due to snow then we will backtrack um, and have the op opportunity to practice saddling our horses um, and manipulating the saddles and bridles. If there is not extra time at the end of lab, um, we will tack that on to next week. So just be prepared, uh, make sure that you have reviewed that information um, and that you're comfortable with going ahead and saddling and bridling your horse. So if there is time at the end of lab, we will do that this week. If not, we're going to tack that on to week seven.